we're in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 30. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 30. I'll give you guys a second to look that up in your devices or your physical Bibles. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 30. Um, now, before I read this, uh, I was tossing up with it to say this as I start my sermon and before I do the Bible reading. Uh, I might do it before. Um, I just want to give a disclaimer uh, that my, I, I mentioned this last week as well, today's sermon is the sermon that might be controversial. I know every week I've been saying that. This is the passage that like other pastors that tune into our podcast uh, actually like contacted me. Even Pastor Eddie yesterday when he found out I'm preaching from Romans 8, 18 to 30, he's like, oh, you're, you're very brave to preach this in a Pentecostal church. Um, however, um, I don't want today's sermon to be about, be about theological stances. Uh, I will touch on that very, very briefly. Uh, I want this sermon to be about what encouragement we can draw from today's passage. I don't want it to be about theological controversies. I want us to look at how Paul was trying to encourage the church in Rome and what encouragement we can draw from that today. Uh, but you'll, you'll see, even as I do the reading, why this is controversial. Uh, so Romans 8, 18 to 30. For I consider the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is revealed to us. For the, cre- for cre- for the creation waits with eager longing. For the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have been the first who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, we pray that today's passage would be a source of encouragement uh, for all of us at FLM that it would spur us on to pray despite our shortcomings, to commune with God despite our imperfections, that we wouldn't allow our inability to discourage us from being active and hardworking agents of the kingdom of God. So, Lord, we pray for wisdom. We pray for humility. We pray that we would set aside any presuppositions we might have about what the Christian life should look like and that we would approach the text with a clean slate and a humble heart to hear what you have to say. And so, Lord, once again, may you watch over the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, uh, before jumping into today's sermon, today's exposition of this passage isn't to give uh, an argument against Pentecostalism or for Presbyterianism. Um, That's another conversation that we can have offline. Uh, But you'll see that today, uh, Paul, in writing Romans 8, 18 to 30, 
Uh, one of the things I want to point out was that the purpose of this wasn't to talk about spiritual gifts, and we'll see why in a moment. But Paul begins in verse 18, uh, and it's almost like a segue verse from last week's passage. Verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul, up until now, throughout the opening eight chapters of Romans, he's spoken about the doctrine of justification by faith, that we're saved by who we believe, not by what we've done. He's spoken about the doctrine of federal headship, how we were once under Adam, but now we're under Christ. He's spoken about the doctrine of sanctification, how for anyone that's born again by the Spirit of God, they are going to grow from day to day into Christ. They're going to start to look like Christ, resemble more and more of Christ. And if you are born again, you are going to grow in holiness. And then we saw that he spoke about the role of the Mosaic law, the Old Testament law. And he unpackaged that big question, what purpose does the law have if we're saved, not by obedience, but by faith? And then last week, we saw Paul unpackage the doctrine of adoption, that we are sons and daughters adopted into God's family. We are legitimate sons and daughters of the Most High God. And we saw that Paul didn't just describe that we're adopted. We're not just children. But the Father loves us with the same intensity with which he loves the Son. Just as the Son of God, Christ is the heir of God, we too, Paul says, are co-heirs with Christ. And so it's in light of everything that Paul has said that Paul is able to begin verse 18 by saying that he has considered the sufferings. What does that mean? It means he's counted up the cost of what it means to live for Jesus in a world that is fallen and hostile to the Christian faith. Paul begins with this bold statement by saying, you know what? I have counted up everything that this faith in Jesus is going to cost me. I've added it all up. And you know what? I've come to the conclusion that everything I'm going to have to endure for the sake of my faith, it's not even worth comparing to what awaits on the other side of eternity. Saying what comes next is so much more valuable than anything I've got to lose in this life. Now, in the rest of the passage, we're going to see three movements, three transitions in the passage that are neatly divided by this concept of groaning. Uh, We'll see what that means in a moment. The first is found in verses 19 to 22, where Paul talks about creation, groaning. Verses 19 to 22 reads, For the creation awaits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage, to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know the whole creation has been, and there's that word, groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Now, Paul is very poetic sometimes when he writes his letters. And in this passage, he uses a technique called personification. And for those of you that did well in English in school, you'll know that personification is this technique where you give something that's not human, uh, human qualities, like what he's doing here. Creation doesn't literally groan, like this, this floor that I'm standing on doesn't groan, but it's just, it's personification, it's giving it a human-like quality. And Paul says that creation doesn't just groan, but it waits with eager longing. Uh, he uses this word in the Greek called apok. Sorry, I'm going to butcher this. Apokaradokia. It's been a while since I studied Greek. Apokaradokia. And if I were to describe what this means, it's almost like an endearing way uh, of sort of saying that it's waiting with eager anticipation. Like many years ago, when I sh- first became a Christian, one of the first preachers I ever listened to, when like I, I became a Christian when YouTube was starting to take off, right? That's how that's, that's how old I am. But um, one of the first preachers I ever listened to was this guy called Paul Washer. Uh, some of you guys might have heard of him. He's got a lot, lot of brilliant sermons on YouTube. He used to be a, a missionary in South America, and then he became uh, just a, a minister, an itinerant minister that travels America and around the world. 
But I had the privilege of listening to Paul Washer in person. Uh, he came to Sydney. I, I got invited at the last minute. I was so grateful. One of my friends was like, Paul Washer's coming to preach at my church. We haven't announced it to many people. Do you want to come? I was like, yes. So I remember I went and I got there like an hour early. Uh, and I sat in the front. I was like, I was, I was like fangirling. <laughs> and I sat in the front row like eagerly. I even like worried about what would I wear. I don't want Paul Washer to think I'm a, I'm a pagan heathen. So I better dress like a, a conservative Baptist. So I sat in the front row with this Bible. And as I sat there waiting, the MC came to the front and he gave an announcement that Paul Washer's plane had been delayed. Uh, and so he will be coming soon. However, he's not going to stop off at his accommodation. He's just going to come straight from the airport. And so I waited. I was, remember, I was front row. The doors were right at the back. So what did I do? I'm short, right? I turned my neck and I was like stretching my neck as far as I could just to see when the doors would open and Paul Washer would walk through the back doors. He's a giant of a human being, by the way. Like his Bible is massive. He's got those large print Bibles, but it looks small in his hand because he's just a massive person. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. But that's the kind of language that Paul is using when he says that creation waits with eager longing, almost like his... his Creation stretching out its neck. He personifies creation as waiting with eagerness for the revealing of the children of God. Now, this language of revealing the sons of God or the children of God, it implies something. It implies that it's not obvious who is a child of God, right? You wouldn't reveal something that was already obvious, would you? And I think it's Paul's subtle way to suggest that it's not always going to be obvious who is a true believer of Christ. Simply saying verbally, I believe in Jesus, based on what we've seen through Romans, that verbal confession of faith means nothing unless the Holy Spirit has transformed you and granted you a new heart. But without sort of digressing too much, it's obvious that verses 19 to 22, what's the focus? It's creation. Creation awaits with anticipation. And then he makes an interesting statement in verses 20 to 21. Because the fall of man, the sin of Adam and Eve, it brought about a curse, didn't it? If you read through Genesis, the Genesis account, you'll see that the curse of sin, it brought a curse on man, it brought a curse on Satan. But you'll also find that creation was also placed under a curse. Even though creation didn't do anything wrong, right? And Paul is of the same opinion because he, he, he doesn't say that creation invoked the curse by what it did, but it says that creation was subjected. Subjected to the futility. Man's disobedience brought about the curse of sin upon himself, upon Satan, but also upon creation. But what does the gospel do? Remember, the gospel reverses the curse, doesn't it? It reverses the curse on man, from man rather. Why? Because Christ takes that curse upon himself. And so just as the sin of curse is reversed in man and man is restored, the hope is that not only man will be set free, but according to verse 21, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory. And this is where Paul uses that term groaning for the first time. Now, when do people groan? What causes a person to groan? You groan when you're frustrated, right? You groan when you're in pain or in anguish. That's when you groan. You don't groan when you're happy, right? Paul says about creation that it is under a curse brought about by the sin of man for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. That's what Paul says. Yes, we live in a fallen world. Yes, we see the effects of sin on everything. And creation groans. But Paul also adds something else to that section. He introduces this concept of childbirth 
in addition to groaning. Childbirth to describe the pain that creation is in. Why childbirth? If like I know he likes personification, but why would you use childbirth to describe the floor? Right? It's, it's weird. Now I've heard horror stories of women describing the immense amount of pain that's involved with giving birth to a child. I've had female friends almost talk about that pain with a sense of pride, like you'd never be able to go through this. You have no idea. Like, because I always, like I tell them I've got a high pain threshold. They're like, you don't even start. You have no idea how much this hurts. And they're right. I don't know. My extent to the knowledge of how much it hurts is based off what I've heard from my friends and what I've seen in movies. And I've got to say, it looks like it hurts a lot uh, from what I've seen in movies. Just taking a guess. Now, I can only assume that's why Paul used this analogy. Because of the unspeakable pain that causes creation metaphorically to groan. But that's not why... That's not the only reason why. I think the right reason why Paul uses the language of childbirth is because childbirth doesn't just end in pain, does it? What emotions flood the heart of a mother and everyone in the room once childbirth is completed, once that childbirth or child is born? It's relief. It's joy. It's celebration. And so Paul describes groaning in this first movement regarding creation, not to be a negative Nancy, it's like, oh, creation suffering because of what humanity did, but groaning in a positive light, saying that there's something good that's going to come. There is something to hope and anticipate for. Creation is waiting, not just for the sons of God to be revealed, not just for the revelation of who's really in Christ, but it's waiting in anticipation for the curse of sin to be reversed forever. So that's the first movement. The second movement can be found in the verses in verses 23 to 25, where we see this time that it's not only creation that's groaning, but Christians that are groaning. Verses 23 to 25. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, now we hope, or rather, now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Paul explains that Christians are those who have the first fruits of the Spirit. What is that? What is the first fruits of the Spirit? Well, when Paul describes the first fruits of the Spirit, we have to bear in mind everything that Paul has been talking about in his letter to the Romans so far. We saw that those who repent of their sins and place their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that they experience the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. They're given a new heart. They're born again by the Spirit of God. New heart, new desires, a new love. And with this new heart and a new love, they have new desires that brings about a sensitivity towards sin and evil. Sin that didn't bother them previously, sin that they were indifferent to in the past, starts to bother them going forward because the Holy Spirit will weigh this heavily on the conscience of a true believer. Sin that didn't bother them in the past will bother them because it's no longer their source of joy anymore. And this, in a nutshell, was what Paul was describing when he unpackaged the doctrine of sanctification, a growing sensitivity towards sin and a growing in holiness. Now, going back to today's passage, when Paul talks about the first fruits of the Spirit, this is what we need to bear in mind, that this growing in holiness, this sensitivity towards sin, this is what the first fruits is all about. Why? Because this sensitivity towards sin, this growing in holiness, what it is, is it's a foretaste of the glory that's going to come in the future. Now, I'm going to share something with you. This is like a theological term 
or a phrase, this, this idea of the now but not yet. Some, some, some of you might, might be aware of this. But when we talk about the gospel, we talk about being saved. And that's true. We are saved. But at the same time, our salvation isn't completed yet. We're saved, but not yet fully saved. Why? Because there's more to come. It goes back to that old concept. We are saved, but not yet saved. Now, but not yet. We are saved, but our salvation hasn't fully been completed. Even our adoption, right? Remember Paul last week said, you are adopted. Just as Jesus is the son of God, you are just as much a son as he. Just as Jesus is an heir of God, you are co-heirs with Christ. And he talks about it in the past sense. Just as Jesus cries out to the to the Father, referring to him as Abba, Father, this term of endearment, Scripture says you can refer to the Father now with that same term of endearment, that same level of intimacy. You have received this. But then what does he say in verse 23? He says, We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption, right? We wait. He uses future tense. We wait eagerly for adoption. He talks about adoption. Despite saying last week, you are adopted, he talks about adoption in today's passage like as if it's something that hasn't happened yet. It's that sense of now, but not yet when it comes to our salvation. And in this context, when speaking about the first fruits of the Spirit, there is a sense in which now we have received the Spirit, which we have. We are growing in holiness. We're growing in our desire to live in obedience to God. However, there is also a concurrent sense of not yet. Why? Because we're still of the flesh. We still sin. And so Paul says that we're adopted as children of God, but we don't see the full realization, the true fulfillment when it comes to the glory of that adoption until the future. Why? Because in the future, that's when we read our sinful or read ourselves of our sinful bodies, this body of the flesh, and scripture promises that believers will be given a body, a glorified body that is incorruptible. What we get now is a foretaste of the glory that is to come, a foretaste of who we were meant to be, who we were created to be. And so what we get now is the first fruit a sensitivity towards sin. We get the Holy Spirit empowering us to turn from sin and turn to worshipping the one true God, to stop living for self and start living a life of service in love and obedience to God. But again, there's that language of groaning with Christians this time. Why is that? Because we're in the now. We're not in the not yet, we're in the now. And because we're still in the now, we're still in the flesh. And for Christians, we long for what is coming. This struggle, this never-ending struggle with sin, we long for that day of glorification because as children of God, our sin frustrates us. Right? Now again, Paul does not say this to be a negative Nancy. But he says this to encourage us. Verses 24 to 25. For in this hope, we're saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. The doctrine of glorification, the fulfillment of the not yet in the future, when we receive glorified, incorruptible bodies, that's not something we're going to see anytime soon on this side of eternity. According to Paul, because it's a future thing, it's something we have to hope for. However, unlike the hope of this world, hope in things like this, glorification, the hope of the gospel, it's not a flimsy kind of hope like the world offers. It's not a maybe, I hope this will happen. But when we talk about a gospel hope, it is a hope that is grounded in certainty. More certainty than anything we can see with our eyes or touch with our hands. Why? Because gospel hope is rooted in the promise from God himself. 
In fact, for those whose faith is in Christ, the doctrine of glorification, that day that we're going to receive incorruptible bodies, that day that creation and humanity is groaning for that Paul talks about, Paul is so certain that this is going to happen that in verse 30, when he describes that day, he describes it in the past tense. He describes the future in the past tense. Verse 30, and for those whom he predestined, he also glorified. And those whom he glorified, well, sorry, those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Glorification is a future thing, but in verse 30, Paul describes it in the past tense like as if it's already happened because he's that certain that it is going to happen. So creation groans. Christians groan. And as we both look to the future, we have this hope that is almost not even a hope, it's a guarantee. Now, as we move through verses 26 to 30, this is where I have to tread very carefully, we see that creation groans, Christians groan, but we see that the Holy Spirit himself groans as well. Now, before we unpackage verses 26 to 30, we're very careful. We have to remember the context. What has been triggering the groaning up until now? It's frustration, right? Frustration caused by the curse of sin. Frustration that is grounded with this eager longing for a future restoration, right? Like, I'm not reading that into the text. That's what Paul's been talking about to, uh, up until now. So bearing that in mind, let's read verses 26 to 30. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now remember, context. The context of this passage is the frustration of creation of Christians as they long and wait for future restoration and glorification. But I should also point out that another element of the context is suffering. Suffering for Jesus. Because remember, how did Paul begin this passage in verse 18? He says, I've measured out how much it's going to cost me to suffer for Christ. What my faith is going to cost me, I've measured it all out and I've come to the conclusion that having counted up the cost, living for Christ is totally worth it. The glory that's going to come far outweighs anything that's going to happen to me in this life. That's the context. And it's in this context that Paul says in verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, I don't want to dwell on this too much. This is where the controversial part is. And I don't think Paul intended this passage to be controversial. I think he intended it to be encouraging to Christians. But given we are a Pentecostal denomination, I do have to touch on it very briefly. When Paul writes about the Spirit interceding for us, he says the Spirit intercedes with groanings too deep for words. Um, this is a very popular proof text for the spiritual gifts and namely the gift of tongues. However, I don't think Paul was talking about the gift of tongues in this passage. Maybe other passages, just not this one. I don't think spiritual gifts was what Paul had in mind as he was writing Romans 8. And we know this because of a few things. Firstly, nowhere else in Romans 8 does Paul give the slightest hint that he's talking about tongues or even does he insinuate even slightly 
that he's talking about spiritual gifts. There's no reference to spiritual gifts here. Second point, the very fact that Paul describes the spirits intervening as a groaning that's too deep for words implies that this intervention is not a language. It's not using words, meaning that this intervention that the spirit has, it's non-verbal. On the flip side, when we look at the gift of tongues as revealed through scripture, it is 100% verbal. Hence why Paul, when he talks about tongues in other passages, he uses that great term glossa, the tongue, which links and is used rather to speak what? Words. Thirdly, Paul is describing this intercession by the Holy Spirit as being for all believers, right? He's talking, Romans 8 is for all believers. The reason he can't be talking about tongues in Romans 8 is because 1 Corinthians 12.30 implies that tongues is not for all believers. Romans 8 is for all believers, and if it's for all believers, it cannot be talking about tongues because 1 Corinthians 12 implies that tongues is for some, a select group of people within the church. For some believers, not for all. Finally, the spirit interceding, according to Romans 8, is not something that you, according to scripture rather, is not something that you can induce. The spirit interceding on your behalf, according to Romans 8, is not something that you can induce and force to happen. You cannot command the Holy Spirit, God, I command you to do this and that. We are creation under the authority of the creator. We have no authority to command God to do anything. He is a sovereign God. He does as he wills. Tongues, on the other hand, uh, at least traditionally in the Pentecostal denomination, uh, it has been something that often has been sought to be induced. Um, this, these practices of loosening the tongue to utter, uh, you know, different sounds. Uh, intercession from the Spirit, however, isn't something you induce or command God to do. Now, again, uh, that's just a brief discussion. That's, that's all I'm going to spend on that. I just wanted to point out that what Paul is talking about in Romans 8 wasn't intended to be controversial but encouraging for Christians. And the point I'm trying to make is that there are other proof texts for the spiritual gifts. I just don't think this is one of them. Now, if we consider the context of groaning, it was frustration, wasn't it? Suffering, frustration. Frustration because no matter how hard we try, no matter how much we try to grow in our sanctification to look like Jesus, it is not going to be perfect. Far from it. And it's in that context of this frustration that no matter how hard we try to live for God, we continue to fall short. It's in that context that Paul tries to encourage us through Romans 8 by saying, you know what? You fall short but the Spirit of God is here to help you. How? Why? Well, why? Because we're not perfect. Uh, we don't always know the will of God. You know, people come up to me and say, you know, how do I know what the will of God is? And sometimes we're not going to know. Sometimes God will reveal it very clearly. A lot of the times we're not going to know. We're just going to have to make prayerful decisions the best we can. And because we don't always know the perfect will of God in all circumstances, sometimes we're not going to be praying for the things that we should be, right? You know, but my mom, uh, a long time ago, she someone slashed her tires, uh, all four of them. Uh, my mom, you know, financially, she's not a wealthy woman, she's quite poor. Someone slashed all her tires. Why? Because she parked in a visitor's car, car park in her own apartment complex and someone else wanted to park there. And they ended up catching the guy. But I remember my mom, she's like, prayer for almost. I'm going to pray for God to rain fire down on this person. <laughs> right? Probably not praying the will of God, a God of grace and mercy. Like, Gee, he's going to understand the power of prayer. You know, God's going to strike him down. Like, she, was, she was angry, right? Sometimes we don't know what to pray for. Sometimes the motive behind our prayer is flawed 
and imperfect. Sometimes our perspective is very narrow and limited. Even for the prayer warrior who spends hours a day on their knees praying, they're not always going to know the full will of God. And again, even this idea, despite our best efforts praying and not really truly knowing, it comes back to that theme of groaning and frustration, doesn't it? Even if we pray hard, we can't always get it right. But what Paul is saying is that despite all of this, despite all of our shortcomings, we have good reason to celebrate and be encouraged. Why? Because God has designed the mechanics of the gospel that even when we don't know what we should pray for, even when our prayers are sometimes wrong, the Spirit of God understands. The Spirit of God feels our frustration. The Spirit of God covers our shortcomings and our abilities, especially in these circumstances. And even if we pray for the wrong things, the Spirit of God intercedes and prays on our behalf to the Father and brings the right things. Prays in the right way, even when we don't always do so. And it's not just the Spirit of God that gives the help. The way Paul describes the Holy Spirit, he describes the Holy Spirit in a way to suggest that he is the help. He doesn't just give the help, he himself is the help. He doesn't provide security, encouragement, and assurance. The Holy Spirit is the security, the encouragement, and the assurance. Why? Because he's the third member of the triune Godhead. Who better than to have God himself vouching for you? God himself being that stamp of assurance and security. He is able to speak to the Father through a means that goes beyond human comprehension. The point of this passage, remember, it's not to be controversial, not to display a theological stance. The point of Paul writing Romans 8 was to encourage the Christians in Rome and to encourage us today that you are going to fall short. You might think you're a spiritual giant, you still fall short. But guess what? You don't have to be discouraged by that. You can draw encouragement because even when we fall short, we have God interceding for us. We have the Spirit of God every time. You know, one of the things um, when I go to prayer, not not this prayer meeting, uh, previous churches, I would go to prayer meetings and I would hear stuff that was like theologically wrong being prayed and it bothered me, but it's like you read passages like this, like you'd, you'd see Jesus being referred to as the Father or like Father Jesus. Like it's like, no, Jesus is not the Father, Jesus is the Son. Like stuff like that, but it's like, no, the Holy Spirit still intercedes. on Even if we get our theology wrong in our prayers, God still intercedes for us. Isn't that amazing? We have God, the Father, Jesus, the high priest, who offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice to bring about salvation and the eventual future fulfillment of our restoration. And then not only that, Scripture promises us, God says to us, even when you follow me and you fall short, I will still continue to intercede for you. Why? Because you will fall short. Paul writes this to remind us of the Spirit's intercession, to give us hope that even in our prayers, even when we pray for the wrong things, even when our mind isn't set straight, that we're not going to hinder the work of the gospel because God is interceding. This is why Paul's able to give that amazing promise in Romans 8.28. For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Sorry, I'm used to reading that in another translation. All things work together for the good of those who love him. But anyways, Paul says in Romans 8.28, he gives that promise. All things will work together for the good of those who love him. For those who are called according to his purpose. Now again, context. This promise in Romans 8.28, is not saying that if you truly believe God, everything's going to work out well. Because again, what was the context? The context was the assurance that despite our imperfections, God will still pray for us. It's a promise that for those who dwell in Christ, for those in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, 
He will continue to intercede for us even when we pray for the wrong things and empower our walk with Jesus. It's talking about good, not on this side of eternity, but the good that's on the next side of eternity. And Paul says in verse 28 that this is for all Christians because he says it's for those who are called according to his purpose. That's all Christians. And he fleshes that out just so that there's no mistake in verses 29 to 28. He fleshes out what it means to be called according to his purpose. And again, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I think it's self-explanatory. But when he describes Christians, Paul says, but those whom he foreknew, for those whom he chose before Genesis 1, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So they're going to be born again and grow in holiness in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So that's federal headship, just as through Adam, sin, the curse of sin came about. Under Christ, life comes about. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. I'm going to share one final theological term about verses 29 and 30. If anyone asks you what is verses 29 and 30, in theological circles, we refer to this as the golden chain of redemption. The golden chain of redemption. And the reason that term was coined is because it's a chain that God's created that can't be broken. Those whom he called, he predestined. Or rather, those whom he predestined, he called, right? God chose, he calls, he justifies, he glorifies. It's a chain that God initiates, sustains, and completes that cannot be broken by man or by Satan. This is what it means to be a Christian. If you think about it, Romans 8.28, or rather Romans 8 as a whole, covers everything that Paul's been talking about from a doctrinal perspective. Justification, sanctification, adoption, glorification, the law. It covers and summarizes everything in Romans 8 to encourage us, and then that's how it ends. Now, uh, I was at Grace and Bond's wedding yesterday. I got to sit with Pastor Eddie, um, and I love talking to him about ministry. Even he was like, you're preaching from Romans 8. <laughs> you're a brave guy. Um, and we, we talked about sermon preparation and what's involved, and we both agreed about what is the hardest part of sermon preparation. And believe it or not, it's not understanding what the text is about, right? If you study hard enough, read enough books, you can explain what most passages are about. The hardest part is not exegeting the text, but exegeting the congregation. Making that link of, okay, what we know what this passage is about. What does it mean for us today? How can this passage be a source of encouragement for FLM. And there's a few things we can take away, and I'm going to try and summarize this the best I can and make it sound coherent. But I want to remind you guys that the Holy Spirit is constantly interceding for you. Always, right? You know, when we, when we think about God showing mercy and grace, we tend to think of God interceding when we're doing well. Of course God's, God's going to intercede for me when I'm a prayerful person. But the point Paul is trying to make is that God intercedes for you even when you're at your lowest, even when you're at your worst. And when I talk about worst, I'm not talking about you being a good guy that made a few bad decisions. When you're at your most corrupted, if you are a child of God, the Spirit of God is interceding for you. And I want to give you an example. I know this sermon is going, like, going a bit longer than usual. But this is important. You guys know I come from a reform background. Uh, two days ago, there was a, a news announcement that Pastor Alvin shared with me that just I, I, I was shattered. Um, I mentioned that Paul Washer was one of my favorite preachers. After that, it's probably John MacArthur. After that, it's a guy called Steve Lawson, Dr. Steve Lawson. He was the dean of the Master's Seminary in America, probably like the Harvard of reform seminaries. Um, he was a dean. He was the head pastor of his church. He was a mentor to many. Uh, they made an announcement that he was asked, or forced to step down and resign from all his duties because he'd confessed 
to having an inappropriate relationship with another woman that wasn't his wife. Uh, that was quite devastating news for me, particularly because a few years prior, when another celebrated Christian, Rabbi Zacharias, was caught in sexual immorality, Steve Lawson was one of the guys that was probably the most vocal in critiquing where Ravi went wrong, what he should have done to avoid this from happening. And sure enough, uh, this happens to Steve Lawson. And whenever something like this happens, whenever a scandal like this happens, it's like everyone wants to share their two cents. You see millions of blog post videos of like sharing my thoughts on what this, this scandal, even though no one asked for your thoughts, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> you're an insignificant, no one cares what you think about this. But it made me think as I was preparing this sermon, because when we think about the Spirit of God interceding for us, even though we know that the Spirit of God intercedes when we fall short, we never really think of falling short the way Steve Lawson did, falling short the way Ravi did. But that's the promise that Paul has given us, that even when you fall short that far, the Spirit of God is still demonstrating grace Mercy, and he's interceding for you. For men like Steve Lawson and Rabbi Zacharias, no question that they're disqualified from ministry forever. But if they are a child of God, they might not be able to go back into ministry, but the promise of the gospel is that the Spirit of God, if they are children of God, will still continue to intercede. And that's what I want to leave with you and remind you because you are going to come across scenarios and seasons in your life. Maybe you're not going to commit adultery, maybe not sexual immorality, but there are going to be situations where in your eyes I have hit rock bottom, situations where it's like I've, I've reached that point of no return. But the promise is that the Spirit is continuing to intercede for you even in those moments. And Paul gives Romans 8 not to give a theological controversial stance but as an encouragement that when you come to those situations, remember that the Holy Spirit's still interceding for you and take that as an encouragement to keep praying and don't stop praying, even if what you're praying for might not always be correct. This is 100% worth the struggle because it is going to be a struggle. And as we, I, this is something I discussed with Pastor Eddie yesterday as well. And it's all a matter of perspective because there's going to be different groups that will criticize Steve Lawson. Uh, there's people that still criticize Ravi, even though he's dead, uh, that you know, they'll take his books off the shelves and burn them. It's like, oh, he's a... But this is a spiritual war and there are always going to be casualties. How stupid is it to sit there and criticize the casualties instead of pressing on taking encouragement from what Paul says about what the Holy Spirit does when there is a casualty. So let's continue to press on, keep praying, especially in the seasons of struggle, and draw encouragement that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, especially when we struggle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the encouragement that we can draw from Romans 8. Paul never intended Romans 8 to be a passage that triggered controversy, but a passage rather that we can draw encouragement from. And Lord, I pray for FLM and for myself that as we meditate on Romans 8, that that's exactly what we would do. That no matter what season of life we go through, especially in the moments where we fall and we hit rock bottom, when morally we feel corrupted to the point where we can't come back from it, that we would be reminded that in, especially in situations like that, that the Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf with a groaning too deep for words. Lord, we thank you that the gospel, the mechanics of the gospel that you have established aren't established with an over-romanticized view of life, that aren't established with this assumption that if we just believe in Jesus, then everything's going to go swimmingly.
but an understanding that life is hard. Living for you is not easy. Living for the kingdom is going to cost us, as Paul says, but that we can draw encouragement from passages like verse 18, where Paul says, I've counted, I've considered, I've counted and added up the costs and I've come to the conclusion that it's worth it. It is worth suffering. And so I pray for FLM that we would be able to spur each other on through seasons of suffering and be able to remind ourselves, but also each other, that even in suffering, even in frustration, even in our deepest groanings, just like childbirth, that struggle isn't the end, but relief, joy, and celebration is the end because of the victory that was won by Christ our Lord. And we thank you for him. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.